Mr. Kazarian, thank you so much for uh, your time. Thank you. Taking the time here in Athens uh, to talk to Greek reporter. Ευχαριστώ. Παρακαλώ. Please tell us a little bit the story of the name and the company. Um, the name is from a street in P uh, Pawtucket, Rhode Island, which is a small mill town. And we select, I selected the name in 1988 when we founded the firm, or I founded the firm. And it's an area that is all Armenian. I mean, it's, you know, when we grew up as kids, everybody was Armenian. And there's several streets, uh, you know, uh, Japonica Street, Carnation Street, and they're all named after some form of like floral. And Japonica is, which is obviously, it not, has nothing to do with Japan, but it was all Armenian. And when I had left Goldman Sachs, you know, I really wanted something that went back to, my grandfather grew up, my grandfather didn't grow up there, but when he, when he escaped the genocide, he moved there. My father grew up there, I grew up there, and then we were married, we moved there, when I went to Brown, and I, I looked and I said, you know, let's pick something. I never realized people think we're from Japan at the yeah. time, no, that's like, but we get that a lot. Yeah. How did you come up with the idea to uh, go and buy Greek bonds, especially in a country that uh, there was not really much certainty back then? We buy companies, mm -hmm. we turn around companies, we buy like billion dollar companies. Mm -hmm. And um, on February 27th, I, was, I spent about a year taking care of my dad who was sick and he passed away. And the next day I said, well, what am I going to do? Mm -hmm. I, had a, like, I kind of took a little time off from the company to take care of him for about a year. And I said, well, where's the biggest you know, kind of turmoil? Mm -hmm. and I said, Southern Europe. So I left the next morning and, or the day after that, and came, started off, you know, in the bigger countries, started looking for companies. And I said, well, you know, let me go to Greece. So I came here, and I started looking, and I said, you better get in a little understanding of the government and the government's financials. Because you gotta, like, you're gonna need to know that here. Mm -hmm. So I met with a number of people, and I said, can I get the government's financial statements? And the response was, they don't really have financial statements. They have just like little data packets. And I said, well, give me the data packets. And that was in, I think, Feb like, 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 literally like March 1st or something, mm -hmm. 2012, I think. And that's led down the road of, wow, there's this huge difference between the accounting and the economic reality. And that's the evolution. We started looking at companies and we said, whoa, there's this big difference. And we look for accounting anomalies for investments because that's like the safest thing to do. It's not like speculation. It's where there's a gap. And that's how we, you know, and then we started buying bonds. Um, and pretty much when there was a double election, I think in June of that time. And we just were confident with the numbers. People were worried. So we started buying bonds when like at 1140 and had just been <laughs> buying them pretty much ever since. And from then to now, I think bonds have been gone up, right? Am I right? I mean, yeah, I think the well. bonds are like 55, so we've had a, so and we, we own, good. we're I think one of the largest, if not the largest owner. The mm -hmm. pension fund owns about six billion. Mm -hmm. You know, we're pretty large mm -hmm. and it's been a very, very successful investment for us. I want you to, to tell us a little bit about this accounting uh, method that you, you're using, and uh, what is this method, and how can we simply say it? Simplest way to think about it is, there's international standards for accounting for public sector, sovereigns, governments, and the EU doesn't use those international standards. They use a, a legal framework for measuring your debt, and measuring your financial performance, but it's not accounting. It's not generally accepted accounting principles. It's, you know, we could, it, it's, it's, it, it's economically irrational, because it's legal, and it's anachronistic, because it's really based on like a 1992 treaty, the Maastricht Treaty. It was never intended really to be, it, it was meant for legal compliance purposes. Mm -hmm. What was Greece really started changing as much in 2009 and many of the restructurings in 2010 and then forward, the difference between the economic reality of the number and the actual kind of stated number, which is stated out of Eurostat, which is kind of an entity out of Belgium, that is not 
That's not an accounting number. And what we did was we developed our own financial analysis using generally accepted accounting principles, and we picked the toughest one, the most rigorous international one, which is called Ipsos. It's really, really hard. It's demanding. But we said, if we're going to put, apply a standard to Greece, let's apply the toughest, most rigorous accounting standard so that you know, you'd, really, you'd hold it to a high bar. Like you'd use the Singapore standard, the New Zealand standard, like I mean, these really awesome, you know, financially well-run countries. And that's where we saw this huge difference where the debt, you know, most people talk about as being like, you know, 179 or 180 percent of GDP, it's really well below 100, which is just like amazing. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, sets off a very different investment dialogue. Like, you know, wow, the, the number that they're showing for debt right now is, is, is it, it's, a, it's, it's what we refer to as like a future value. Mm -hmm. it's a, it, that's not an accounting concept. Like there's no thing, there's, there's not an accounting concept like the future value of debt. No, you have like a fair value, you have an accounting adjustment, and it evolves each time. That's not what they're using. They're using like a future value. And that's not, that doesn't reflect reality. Moody's and Fitch and all these companies, uh, they have their own way of evaluating uh, the situation. Is there any way that we can find one acceptable way for everybody? And how can we do that? They rely almost blindly on the current numbers that are used, which are not economic reality number. They can't create, they, we've spent you know, huge amounts of money in 20, 20 months and a team of like 70 people to develop, you know, IPSIS, which it's called, International Best Standard for Account, Public Sector Accounting Standard. The agencies can't do that. That's not, not what they do. They take a number from a database and they use it. So they take, for example, the 180 mm -hmm. and they put it in their reports. And they go, well, if the number is 180, then you must have a huge amount of debt. That's, so they're, they're just responding to a number. And the fact that Greece doesn't have its own financial statements, like if you were to buy a company, or any large, like, like a Singapore or New Zealand, they have like realistically financial statements that have like uh, profit and loss in them, or the first page which is financial performance, they'll have a balance sheet, they'll have the footnotes. Mm -hmm. Greece doesn't have that. And so as far as the elected officials, or the, the, the government officials, they have to make their decisions without having real financial information that portrays reality. So you're kind of handicapping your government by not giving them like real numbers that reflect reality. And from a capital markets point of view, partly why your bonds are yielding 9% right now instead of 5 and what is that you don't have financial statements to give someone who looks here and says, okay, let me, let, me, let me independently look at, let me not rely on what the rating agencies say, because they were wrong in 2009. I mean, in 2009, when the numbers here were really very, like, not attractive at all, they still had you in an A+. Mm -hmm. And you look back at 2009 and you say, how could they have ever done that? So would you say to investors to have second, I, would, I don't want to say the word not to trust them, but yeah. to always have second thoughts for those um, rating I, I would say that you really should want financial statements. Mm -hmm. That's like, that's, you know, if you're going to make an investment, you should have real quality financial statements. And that's like, and then, and then, and then what you should become very comfortable or more comfortable with Greece is when they embrace financial statements and they publish audited financial statements by, you know, audited by professional external firms. Your confidence in that management, your confidence in the country, your confidence in their decision making goes way up. Because for, for, you know, we wanted, and we still want, Greece to be the first nation in the EU to have audited highest global standard, gold standard financial accountings. So you can really say to the world, hey, we have the best accounting. Mm -hmm. This has been audited. It's the hardest, the most difficult standard. We adopted it. And then with those numbers, then, then so much changes. Like large investors who can't afford to develop the time, they can now look at your financial statements and say, hey, their debt really is, wow, it really is up below 100%. Mm -hmm. Their primary balance is really much better. Their debt sustainability is so different from what everybody says. Instead of using a legal number, which is just wrong, I mean, the number's just not right. Mm -hmm. And that's... Do you intend to keep the bonds for long term? We, we are a, we, we may, we will either hold them to maturity 
because we're making about 25% a year, okay, which is like very attractive. And mm -hmm. to have that every year for 20 years, that's like extraordinary. Mm -hmm. Or um, when we first came here, you know, we were looking for companies. There's a lot of, you know, assets that are available here. Mm -hmm. If there's an opportunity, much like we did with Allegheny International, where we exchanged. Yeah. No, and I asked you that because yeah. uh, when it comes to, to governments and countries, you can't probably have the same control that you would have with a company. No. Y y when you have a bond, you have a fixed maturity. Mm -hmm. So it's a different investment. Mm -hmm. They're like UK law bonds. Mm -hmm. So they're really like, they're, they're government, we're very comfortable with that. So you don't have that level of concern, which makes it a very attractive instrument. It's a good bond. Mm -hmm. It's a good bond. Now, much like we do with Allegheny, where we switched our bonds for equity in the company, mm -hmm. there is an opportunity here. Our objective or goal is that you publish, or publish audited financial statements. Mm -hmm. We have in the past exchanged our bonds for assets. Okay. There are a number of assets mm -hmm. that the government owns that they would like to sell. That's a different decision. That's, mm -hmm. you know, where if we can buy companies or assets where we can, you know, bring our expertise and value and marketing skills and R&D skills, you know, that's something we'd consider. And mm -hmm. that's what we initially were looking for here. Mm -hmm. So the bonds are nice, solid. You know, it's a very, very attractive investment right now for us. And I think, it, you know, yeah, at 55, they're still yeah. really attractive. Yeah. You know, we see them going to 85 next year, which is like a nice return in and of itself. Mm -hmm. um, but if we can take those, and exchange them for assets. We become more comfortable. It's important though, because that then exposes us to a very different set of investment circumstances. Mm -hmm. Those issues that you bring up now come because it's equity. Mm -hmm. And that's when like the government, and our view is, you know, yeah, there's gonna be changes, but if you have financial statements that hold you to a higher level of discipline, yeah. and they are audited, and they're reported, then even if there is a change, at least there's numbers that people can see mm -hmm. and they'll gain confidence for that because sometimes your numbers not, may not be great, mm -hmm. but if at least people know them and they can see them and they can see the footnotes and they can understand them, then your concern becomes a lot less. Okay, so maybe you didn't do so great, but at least you're telling us yeah. and you're explaining what happened and you're making decisions knowing that you know, this is what's going on. That gives you more confidence in buying equity and buying companies. Mm -hmm. So that's like, yeah, your point's right, and that's kind of the second step mm -hmm. that we'd be looking at. Who is Paul Kazarian? I'm Armenian, by, I'm American Armenian. I grew up with my grandparents and my dad, but with my grandparents, and they were there, and I learned a lot about our history and our culture and learned to become a very, you know, passionate Armenian. Mm -hmm. And then I was lucky enough to be a fairly good athlete, um, and I went to, you know, college. And what sport? I played three sports in college. I played uh, foot, American football. And I played indoor outdoor track. Okay. I was bigger than, than I am now. Um, and had good grades. Went to, you know, undergraduate, then I went to Brown to get a master's in political theory or political science. Yeah, you didn't study economics, right? No. Right? No. no, it was political theory, La Crusoe, Aristotle, Plato. Mm -hmm. And that's what I was, I mean, I assume I'd be a professor or something, which is yeah. what I, my initial goal was. And then, after I got my master's, I said, well, let me go to New York and get two more degrees. Kind of a typical, kind of not so unlikely Armenian path. Yeah. And I started, law, I went to business school and I was going to law school at Columbia. And then after the first year, um, New York's very expensive. I got a summer job. It was a nice one at a place called Goldman Sachs. Hmm. I just, I didn't know what they were, but they offered a reasonable amount of money. And so well, I, I took the job. The and it was like, this is kind of interesting stuff.